Good morning. My name is Lori Yanucci Grimm. I am the I'm from Great Lakes Neurotechnologies, and I will be the facilitator for this morning's webinar. We are very fortunate today to be joined by Maggie Abrams. Um, uh, Maggie, as a student at Ohio State University, used the bioradio uh, in some research that that she did. And this morning, she's going to talk to us about that and just go into that deep, go into more detail about her research how the bioradio was used there, and conclusions from that research. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to you, Maggie. Thank you so much, Lori. Um, as Lori said, my name is Maggie Abrams, and I'm currently a physical therapist at The Ohio State University. But like she said, I'm sharing with you some research I did while I was still a student. Um, are you able to advance? I'm not. OK. Try this. OK. Should be yours now. Still not yours? Um, I'm not sure. OK. I think it's, uh, it should be with Yep, there you go. Okay, great. So I'm going to share with you um, just some background that will be pertinent as we go forward talking about this project. The pelvic floor muscles form the floor of the pelvic basin, and its job is to contract. Um, and with this contraction, um, there's a sphincteric closure action and a craniovental lift action. Um, it plays a role in continence and elimination, trunk stability, respiration, and maintenance of intra-abdominal pressure, among other functions. The transverse abdominis is the deepest abdominal muscle whose fibers run transversely around the abdomen. When it contracts, it compresses the abdomen like a muscular corset. And it, too, plays a role in continence and elimination, trunk stability, respiration, and maintenance of intra-abdominal pressure. The diaphragm is a dome-shaped muscle that forms the barrier between the chest and the abdomen. When it contracts, it moves downward to create a vacuum that helps the lungs fill with air. It returns to its dome-like shape passively, contributing to exhalation in the process. It also plays a role in continence and elimination, trunk stability, respiration, and maintenance of intra-abdominal pressure. As you can see, the diaphragm, transverse abdominis, and pelvic floor muscles work together to carry out the functions of continence and elimination, trunk stability, respiration, and maintenance of intra-abdominal pressure. The pictures at the right illustrate how these muscles work together during breathing, at rest, and nose blowing. Conversely, the dysfunction of these muscles also seems to be interrelated. It has been shown that patients with low back pain demonstrate delayed feed forward activation of the transverse abdominis, pictured bottom right. The solid line, I'm going to try to denote that with the mouse here, the solid line denotes EMG onset of the deltoid muscle for shoulder flexion, and the dashed line identifies transverse abdominis EMG onset. So where I'm pointing, the dotted line is on the left, and the solid line is on the right. You'll notice that transverse abdominis activation occurs after deltoid activation in the far right person, um, which is the low back pain subject of this study, as opposed to before the other in the other two subjects, these first two on the left. It has also been shown that patients with low back pain have abdor abnormal diaphragm function, altered breathing patterns, and pelvic floor muscle dysfunction. I think most persuasive is that Smith et al. found that low back pain correlated more strongly with disorders of breathing incontinence than obesity or physical activity. While this interrelationship of dysfunction has been demonstrated with low back pain, SI joint dysfunction, incontinence, and breathing disorders, it has not yet been demonstrated in patients with chronic pelvic pain. 
Chronic pelvic pain is pain in the pelvis lasting at least six months in duration and can include a variety of diagnoses, including interstitial cystitis, endometriosis, and vulvodynia. The prevalence is high among women in the U.S. at 14.7%, and unfortunately, the etiologies of these diagnoses are not well understood, so treatment outcomes are limited. This leads us to our research question. Do the diaphragm and transverse abdominis function differently in patients with chronic pelvic pain compared to healthy controls? Our goal was to recruit 10 female patients with chronic pelvic pain and 20 healthy controls so that we could match them by age and activity level. We had a large list of exclusion criteria, including other diagnoses that might refer pain to the pelvis or negatively affect their breathing, such as pregnancy or history of asthma. We also excluded those who participated in activities that would make them exceptional breathers, such as playing a wind instrument or running. This is the full list of tests and measurements that we plan to take. Some of them we used to describe the groups to ensure that they were similar and different in the ways we expected. The other tests we used to compare between groups to answer our research question. The measure in red, inductance plethysmography, is what we measured using the bioradio. Oh, I'm so sorry. I went, went ahead too fast. There we go. We used three surveys to capture patients' pelvic pain, back pain, and respiratory symptoms. We used the female version of the CPSI, the Oswestry, and the Medical Research Council questionnaire, respectively. The MRCQ includes questions about coughing, phlegm, breathlessness, wheezing, chest illnesses, past illnesses, and smoking. And that's right here. We also measured BMI and waist-to-hip ratio to make sure our groups were not different with regard to these. Both BMI and waist-to-hip ratio have been found to be inversely related to um, functional capacity. As strength measurements for the diaphragm and transverse abdominis, we use maximal inspiratory and expiratory pressures. We made our own spirometer using a mouthpiece. Here, I'll go. Sorry. Here it is. <laughs> we, used our, we made our own spirometer using a mouthpiece, tubing, and a manometer taken from a blood pressure cuff. Age-based lower limits of normal have been established for both of these measures. This is where the bioradio came in. We measured the change in circumference of the rib cage and abdomen um, during quiet and deep breathing in three different positions, supine, sitting, and standing. This was taken by respiratory inductance plethysmography bands, or RIP bands, whose output are in voltage that is linearly related to changes in circumference. While RIP bands are often used to track respiration rate and timing or to predict tidal volume, we plan to use them to describe the relative contributions of the rib cage and abdomen to breathing. A possible abnormal finding of rib bands is thoracoabdominal asynchrony, which I'll talk more about shortly. So in this picture, you can see there's a band around the chest and a band around the abdomen. Um, and I'm so sorry, I, my slide seems to be a little large for this viewer. Um, but you can see the output along these graphs. This is actual output we took from um, the bioradio. And so um, one of these. Uh, signals is chest and one of them is abdomen. To capture these relative contributions, we took a ratio of the standard deviations of the outputs of the rib cage band to the abdomen band. Standard deviation describes the variability of the voltage. So if the circumference of one of the bands is changing more, implying a greater contribution to breathing, then its standard deviation would be higher. In these graphs pictured here, the blue is the rib cage output and the green is the abdomen output. You can see that for the participant on the left, her rib cage contributes much more to her breathing, so her ratio is quite high. For the participant on the right, her rib cage and abdomen contribute almost equally, so her ratio is close to one.
thoracoabdominal asynchrony um, is what I'm going to talk about now. Um, in normal breathing, the rib cage and abdomen expand and contract together. So thoracoabdominal asynchrony is where they are out of sync. This can be seen in a variety of diagnoses, including COPD and diaphragm paralysis, but it does not always correspond to a clinically relevant respiratory problem. If we wanted to measure this, we'd probably use um, phase angle, which would treat the rip band data like sinusoidal waveforms and measure the difference between the waves. Zero degrees, pictured at the bottom here, um, would mean that the waves were completely in sync, and 180 degrees, um, pictured second to last here, would mean that they were completely out of sync. Um, Aloe Verde et al. Um, established upper limits of normal for healthy males of 14 degrees. So just a little out of sync. Um, definitely not even this out of sync, not 90 degrees, but just 14. Um, however, we did not plan to analyze this, um, analyze our data this way, because we really didn't expect to see this. The last measurement we took was the Saruman test, which is a progression performed in supine designed to challenge the lower abdominals. Our hypotheses were that, that healthy controls would perform better on the MIP, MEP, and Saruman tests, and that they would demonstrate a higher contrib contribution of the abdomen to their breathing with a smaller ratio as compared to patients with chronic pelvic pain. For our results, our recruitment um, went as planned for healthy controls, but was very poor for patients with chronic pelvic pain, in spite of many um, patients being identified by our referring PTs. Um, this table includes all of our descriptive measurements for the, um, for the discussion of our data um, in this uh, table. Our controls will be on the left, um, and then I've just got each patient with chronic pelvic pain described individually on the right. The top half of the table includes the measures we wanted to be similar. So up here, you can see that our control group was young, active, and slim. Luckily, both patients were relatively close to these averages. The bottom half of this table um, down here uh, presents the results of the surveys, which we expected to differ. As you can see, the patients reported significantly more pelvic and back pain, but not many more respiratory symptoms. So these are much higher in the patients, and then the respiratory symptoms aren't much higher. Here um, are the maximal inspiratory and expiratory pressures. Um, I have both MIP and MAP on this graph. Um, MIP is pink and MEP is blue, with pressures down the side um, and participant number across the bottom. And then I just have the patients with chronic pelvic pain as the very last patients listed. Um, you can see that there really doesn't seem to be any big difference between them. Both patients lie relatively within normal um, for both MIP and MEP. In these plots, I have quiet breathing on the right and deep breathing on the left. Um, the ratios are down the left and participants are across the bottom. I have drawn a line at a ratio of 1, um, which would imply equal contribution of ribcage and abdomen. You can see that supine, or the blue dots, largely fell below this line and that sitting and standing, the pink and green, are generally above. The red boxes, again, identify the patient, and you can see that there appears not to be any difference between them and the controls. All right, now to the good stuff. This slide shows the output of the bands for a typical control on top, and then the first patient with chronic pelvic pain that I tested on the bottom. You can see that the control waves are in sync, while the patients are very much out of sync. So we definitely added phase angles to our data analysis to capture this thoracoabdominal asynchrony. 
If we look at the spread of this data, you can see that for deep breathing on the left, most controls breathe very in phase with very few breathing asynchronously. So it's just these few that um, are, are demonstrating some asynchrony. Um, whereas two out of two patients <laughs> demonstrate thoracoabdominal asynchrony here. Um, obviously, it's not a very large test group, um, but it's definitely uh, a large percentage. <laughs> this might be anomalous or it could be significant. We don't really know. Last but not least, um, we look at the Saruman data. And while both patients scored pretty low, the range of scores for the controls was very wide. So the patients don't appear to be very different from our control population. So as discussion, um, from this data, it appears that patients with chronic pelvic pain do not differ from healthy controls for MIP and MEP, for rib cage to abdomen ratio, um, and for the Saruman test. But they may differ for phase angle of rib cage to abdomen, abdomen timing, um, which the bio radio really allowed us to find. Um, there are definitely some limitations for this study, namely the small sample size. Um, we also did not inquire about what types of chronic pelvic pain the patients had. Um, we don't know a lot about normal phase angles, especially since a few of our healthy controls demonstrated thoracoabdominal asynchrony. Um, and the Saruman test has not been validated and may not be a reliable test to use for um, core strength. Um, there were definite benefits to using the bioradio for this study, um, namely its ease of portability. We tested patients in multiple positions, and I was doing this testing in a big lab and needed to move all around the lab, and the bioradio really made this easy. Um, and then I think most importantly, uh, the bioradio's output is visual, and had we not looked at the data and saw that it was out of sync, we wouldn't have even measured phase angle between the signals. Um, so I'm really thankful we were able to use the bio radio for this. That's all. OK. Um, very, very interesting, very interesting presentation, Maggie. Are you planning to take your research any further? Is, 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 will there be any follow up? I absolutely want to. My goal is to get those last, actually, really, I'd like to get um, 18 more uh, chronic pelvic pain subjects and really do a good comparison. In school, I had limited time to complete the project before graduation. Um, so now I'm uh, working to sort of get all the um, you know, IRB stuff uh, renewed <laughs> and, and to pursue it going forward. <laughs> Excellent. Now, you are currently a physical therapist at the, the Wexler Medical Center, correct? Yes, ma'am. Yep. Are you putting your experiences, what you've gained from this research, are you putting that to use in, in any way with, with patients? Or observing, <laughs> maybe making some observations that relate back to your research? Absolutely. Absolutely. I really... Um, it, absolutely. <laughs> it's kind of hard to retrain breathing. Um, I think what would be ideal is if we could um, get a bioradio here at the clinic, because um, then not only could we finish the study, but we could maybe use it as a form of biofeedback so that patients can see what their breathing's doing. Um, we already use biofeedback, you know, for training the pelvic floor and for activation of transverse abdominis. Um, so I think it. it makes perfect sense in the tool bag of a physical therapist. Excellent. What, um, you know, this isn't related, well, I guess maybe, yeah, related to the research is, as a result of what you learned, um, like, what, what takeaways are there for a patient? Are, are, are you doing anything with patients because of anything you learned differently with patients because of something you learned from the study? Um, definitely. I, um, I always assess breathing um, no matter how low in the body the pain is. Um, and I, I definitely try to have that be one of the fundamental treatments. Um, obviously, the research hasn't gone so far as to know 
um, you know, how much this breathing dysfunction contributes to the symptoms. We, we, you know, we don't know cause and effect in this situation, um, but it, if there's a possible cause, um, I'm, I'm definitely trying to address it. Okay. Excellent. Well, well Maggie, again, um, you know, we, we thank you very much for, uh, for, for your presentation. This is uh, really interesting material, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm eager to distribute this to the group because I think they'll, they'll get a lot of value out of this. Um, Thanks so much.